அந்த மாதிரி தேர் இந்தியா <laughs> last two years uh, due to covid pandemic and lots of restrictions we shifted our teaching from offline mode to online mode and uh, initially we learned a lot we were actually ignorant about these techniques when we learned it we started delivering our whatever we did there uh, but there are certain myths so there are certain realities what we are going to highlight So let's try to see it and uh, let's learn it because no one is perfect madam is from education faculty so she knows what we should do in online teaching how to touch the students when they are not in front of us in the class we can read their face and we can understand whether they are following or not But in online it is little difficult so now madam is going to highlight all those things the myths and the realities of online education so and uh, don't forget to put your questions in chat box so that uh, we can get uh, responses from madam so madam and uh, the time is yours you may start uh, thank you uh, professor bartendo uh, let's uh, dear students or uh, dear participants sorry let's begin our uh, second session that is on myths and realities of uh, online Uh, education in india uh, some um, yeah as professor patendu said that uh, like during pandemic when the pandemic struck and the lockdown this online thing was imposed on us and uh, but still the narratives which is being woven around the online education a lot of halabulu and this uh, this hype so this session is um, a kind of a realistic stock taking of what are the myths which are being propagated by several stakeholders uh, from education within inside of education and outside of education state uh, also and what are the ground level realities so i doubt as uh, dr ba- as professor bartendu said that i may suggest certain um suggestion uh, but uh, i may i may not uh, basically i this session is about uh, what are the myths which are being um, propagated which are being repeatedly said on uh, several uh, platforms including state media private media and what are the ground realities uh, again in in terms of the data provided by state or other uh, agencies and uh, what would be a judicious response like we should not be swayed away uh, with uh, with these uh, with these narratives you know uh, we should focus on um, like we should uh, we should uh, we should decide on the hard facts which are there Uh, and then uh, we can think about uh, how how much feasible this thing is that and if it is feasible at all then uh, how can we utilize it what are the pitfalls of uh, this thing what would be the plus point of um, this online thing so uh, with that let's begin and there are three myths which are being propagated and propelled uh, right from the beginning and uh, at the very large scale or in a very dominant voice is that uh, the online education is accessible it is affordable and it is equal like it promotes the equal quality access to equal quality of education you know uh, and that's why it's equal though it is not that uh, only the after pandemic uh, these myths have been um, started doing round uh, in educational discourse uh, prior to that uh, like in terms of the educational technology or the potential of technology uh, these discourses were there uh, 
but uh, they were not so much loud, you know, because pandemic uh, has provided a kind of shift uh, in the entire debate and the, all the world uh, was forced to, to go online. Um, whether you are prepared or not, it doesn't matter. Whether you are doing it correctly or not, uh, whether somebody, uh, some, some sections uh, are included or not, but we just marched and marched and marched. So I'll take one by one. So the first myth that it is accessible, like anyone can access online education. And since it is accessible, it democratizes the accessibility and that's why it's a really good thing. So I'll take the first myth and then I will put before you some of the realities uh, and then uh, like uh, sequentially, like the claim of affordability that myth and then uh, the equal access. So let's begin the first claim of online education, the first myth, which uh, we, we we constantly remind, uh, constantly we are being reminded of that it is accessible, it's easily accessible. A uh, lot of people are discussing uh, and they were discussing like in the last last two years, we are we have seen that uh, that how to better online education, you know, and I I have seen a lot of seminars um, and conferences online uh, where uh, the theme was that how to better online education, uh, as if uh, we we are talking about the how to better it as if that online class is a regular phenomenon. Uh, online classes are not a regular phenomenon. Like prior to uh, February or March 2020, when the, the COVID hit and the lockdown was there, online classes is not a regular phenomenon. In-person classes are regular phenomena. Even in the courses, like the, the courses which are supported by uh, high technology uh, from both sides, from institution, from student side, like IIT and IIM, they primarily rely on the on the in-person classes or we, we can call it face-to-face -face classes though certain portions of uh, their teaching learning was uh, done through online thing but largely from school education uh, from the liberal uh, courses of higher education uh, it was an absent phenomenon so online classes but we were talking and we are talking like uh, how to better online education as if that online online system of education is there it is prevalent there and we have to make it better uh, that is like we are not talking whether the online system is there or not but instead of uh, raising that question which are pertinent that whether the online uh, accessible education is there or not we were um, the entire academia and higher education we diverted our attention to make it better a non-existent system you know we cannot better a largely non-existent thing. And when I'm saying it's a non-existent, you have to think the length and breadth of India. And you, you should not focus your attention only on the middle class, uh, this higher education, uh, privilege uh, central school or uh, central universities uh, setting, you know? You have to think in terms of uh, the number of the students and the teachers and the number of schools which are there, uh, state universities, state universities, uh, colleges affiliated to state universities, uh, which uh, like which are devoid of any resources. So, my my argument is that you cannot make better a largely non-existent thing. First, you have to have a thing, then you can make it better. And if you are insisting to make a better a non-existent thing you are nothing doing, but you. it is a deliberate and brazen attempt of normalization or inequity. Uh, I'm really sorry. Yeah, it's okay. So, we, uh, we are, uh, while talking about that, uh, how to make online system better, how to make online system better, organizing a lot of seminars and symposia, we are shying away of discussing the issue of accessibility. You know, we are trying to avoid this um, this hard hitting fact that it is not accessible. Instead of asking those uncomfortable question, 
the uncomfortable question to authorities in state, we are discussing, we, we, we channeled our energy to discuss that, uh, how to make it better. And it is an attempt to normalization of inequity. You know, there is inequity, but we are not talking about it. It's a, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an attempt of the normalization. Or you are talking that it is, it is, it is a matter of uh, no consequence that majority of students do not have access. And since we are, um, but again, uh, like we are not talking about it. So let us let us discuss uh, this issue of accessibility in terms of the data and the data provided by either by the state, central government or state government or some independent researchers. Uh, so let us start with the internet access because online education cannot be done in the absence of internet connection and in the computational device. You need a smartphone or laptop or tablet. Uh, and in India, smartphone penetration is, is higher than the laptop and tablet. Uh, but then there's a class divide also the very small percentage of uh, population has uh, this access. So let's, let's have some, the hard, hard fact. So there is a distinction between general internet access and internet access at home. You know, general internet access, the, the, the student from marginal section or the poor section or not very tourist section, you can have access in uh, access to internet uh, through cyber cafe. And in very, uh, like in small town, in, uh, in, a, in a small cities, uh, students have internet uh, access while going to cyber cafes and um, they can check their email and they can uh, do uh, social media thing or anything, whatever they want. Or some of the students, they have internet access uh, provided by the universities. But in the lockdown, both the things like the cyber cafes were closed, markets were closed, your mobility was restricted. So the general internet access, like there are data about general internet access and there is data about the internet access at home. So, so if you have internet access at home, then only you have access to uh, the online classes. Uh, you had access to online classes in pandemic, you know, in general in pandemic. Uh, so, Obviously, after post-pandemic, you have uh, some uh, more access to to online uh, to internet uh, than it was in the pandemic. But again, it is not a high high number. Only eight percent home with the school education school children have the computer with net connection at home. Uh, the direct um, like uh, assessment of how many. Uh, homes have internet access, but uh, the NSSO 2014 survey on education, uh, it computed that if a child uh, reported, if a, if a household reported the internet access and the computing device, uh, uh, computing device, then it was, uh, assume that uh, they have that home has internet access and only 12.5 percent of households of students uh, like th those households which have a student at any age like from school to higher education they have access to internet the majority of students those who access internet uh, in general they had through the cyber cafes or public um, internet uh, uh, wi-fi or availability and in the institutions in which they were studying, if the institution provided them. So 12.5% of households is, is a very, very small number uh, of the households who have internet access at home. Uh, these are clear cut rural urban divide, 27% uh, home in urban areas, while 5% in rural areas are with internet access at home. So obviously the student from urban area, they have advantage over the students, those who are rural area or in pandemic, all the students were forced uh, to go to uh, th their home. So in that sense, they did not have that access uh, in that time. Post-pandemic, yeah, roughly like you can say that the students, those who are enrolled uh, in a in an urban area, good university college, uh, they have internet access uh, provided by the institution. But still uh, those students, if they go, like uh, in, in vacation at home, they cannot complete the task while uh, they are doing uh, this internet um, online thing or online education. Uh, internet access among university students, uh, as I said, all, already I said that uh, in urban area, 
internet access in general, uh, students, 85% of students have internet access. And in urban area, the internet access at home are 41%. Uh, in rural area, there is uh, only 25% of students have internet access at home. Uh, just um, give me a, a kind of, uh, you know, I am really, uh, I have to take a call. It's really important. It will take a quick uh, interruption and, and I'll, I'll be back. Okay. Yes, and so if or the that it can mean. So uh, let's uh, mostly 51% uh, student, uh, those who are enrolled in university come from the rural area. So they did not have um, access to the online thing. But in general, uh, there is a clear cut rural urban divide of the internet access and the speed, you know, and the computing device. Uh, like uh, you can uh, you can attend a class uh, on uh, on smartphone, but you cannot read very lengthy text on smartphone. You cannot do a lot of, um, uh, like if the teacher is using really high-tech technology of the sticky notes, uh, presentations, uh, you cannot participate uh, because the smartphone uh, gave you a limited option of doing that in comparison to the laptop. And the penetration of laptop is, is really, really limited. It's a very class issue. Uh, Uh, rural household access, there's this, uh, it's a study by Bandhupadhyaya in 2020 in, at the uh, NSSO, Bandhupadhyaya like, cited the NSSO, the same survey which I gave you the data. And there's a regional variation also, like regional diversity or disparity, uh, we should say, uh, in terms of the in internet access, internet access through merit sources and internet access at home. So Kerala tops uh, with 51%, 23%, Andhra, that's a mid-level. Bihar, the poor state like Bihar, West Bengal, they have really, really low penetration of internet, uh, either through merit sources or household, like there's no, no data was reported. So there is a lot of problem. Like when you talk about online system of education accessibility, uh, the entire India, is like is not um, a, a one picture. There's a lot of regional uh, inequity or inequality you can see in terms of the internet apps. Uh, urban households, even Bihar and West Bengal urban households, they they fare really really low, like eighteen percent, twenty one percent, and rural area no no. There is one more aspect of accessibility, and there is a data of Internet and Mobile Association of India. IAMAI, Nielsen survey. And it was, um, though it was not conducted in terms of uh, online education, et cetera, it was in terms of like uh, uh, men and women who are using uh, internet and computing device. So internet users uh, in percentage, uh, the all India uh, gender gap is 67% male uh, have access to internet and computing device, obviously, and uh, females have 33%. Uh, so it's, it's a way, way, uh, like more than half of the, in comparison to female, male have uh, like in double number of uh, internet access. Uh, when you uh, divide this data, segregate data on the basis of their locality, in rural area, it is more male, male are using 72% and only 28% female are using. An urban area is a 62% and 38% female. Uh, in metro cities, like having more 
a population more than 50 lakh, it is 60-40. Yeah, 60% males are using and uh, only 40% females are using. So then again, it is a kind of access to internet and computing device uh, in terms of gender also. And it creates a kind of gender inequity and equality. So male and female, uh, they both, they do not have uh, equal amount of um, access to internet and online education. Uh, one more source of accessibility is in terms of uh, the language. Uh, we, uh, I have already talked about language inequality or epistemic inequality uh, due to language or access to particular kind of language in the previous session. Uh, mostly online academic content is available in English, you know, and it creates a kind of epistemic inequity for those, those who have, even though they have internet uh, access and the computing device like smartphone and um, laptop, but the content, mostly academic content is available in English. So they cannot be, uh, they, they cannot have uh, the same amount of benefit if they had known the English. So it creates a kind of inequity. Uh, though in recent, uh, like in, in the past um, five to six years, the, the content in the regional languages are like people are uploading and it has increased. All, uh, but if you see the categories in which the regional language content is uploaded, mostly entertainment, uh, marketing, and the banking uh, kind of thing, uh, uh, the, the content you are seeing in regional language and the entertainment dominates like regional language, song, cuisine, recipes, et cetera. But the academic, strict academic content uh, is like economics lectures or uh, history grade-wise or subject-wise specific, um, the good quality online content is very scant content is available in regional language and English dominates. So it has a serious uh, consequence on the learning attainment and we, as, as I have already uh, discussed the, the gender divide in terms of access to English education in the previous lecture, that more girls are in the government school and the government schools are the uh, re regional language school. Most of the government schools, they teach in regional language, Gujarati, Hindi, Tamil, Telugu, Uriya, and the private schools mostly teach in English. So girls are not attending private schools in the same number uh, as comparison to boys. So they have less so they they do not have less access to internet and not only the less access to internet and computing device they also have less access to the uh, the english language content which is available online so even if they have uh, access to internet and computing device they there is disadvantage linguistic disadvantage for for the girls or women in general um, there is accessibility, so you have to think in terms of accessibility, in terms of disability also. Uh, some of the students uh, in higher education, particularly uh, higher education institution, they provide learning assistive technology, you know, uh, like braille reader, uh, uh, the, the scanner, the, the book reader, which is on which you can put your uh, textbook or books and it can uh, read you. Those kind of assistive uh, technology, uh, are available in, in universities, in certain universities, higher education centers. So disabled students can access. But those kind of technologies are not, those are very expensive and those are not available at home. So it is, and those are not available in the state universities also. Uh, so it, it, it creates, a, like if you are a visually challenged student and if you are in a Jamia, uh, you have those kind of access uh, to assistive technology. But if you are in a, in a state university affiliated college, so that accessibility issue is in terms of disability, your location also, um, this is not evenly accessible. Online education or assistive technology is not evenly accessible uh, to, to all category of students like female, disabled, poor, rural poor, et cetera. So this claim that online education is accessible, uh, this claim, this narrative, uh, there is a lot of cracks in that narrative. A lot of loopholes are there. And uh, unless and until the state, uh, when I'm saying state, I'm not referring to any particular state, I'm saying the governance system. If it is not providing uh, a level playing field for all the population, student population, 
online education uh, will remain inaccessible to some and it will remain accessible to to certain privileged class so the second uh, claim is uh, about affordability you know like online education is inexpensive and it is affordable anyone can can you can afford it and that's why the accessibility issue uh, is uh, it can be largely sorted out because online education is is affordable is inexpensive so the second myth is that it is affordable and inexpensive uh, let us discuss uh, in terms of the hard facts and data uh, online education is not state funded we all know that and it seems that it won't be in future uh, it won't be provided uh, like in terms of the data or the computing device or internet access it is not uh, it is it is the responsibility of having a, a smooth uh, uninterrupted internet access uh, by by the students themselves uh, and the computing device it is it is their responsibilities there is very less uh, state support uh, in terms of gadget support technological training assistance etc is there if it is there it is commendable but it is not there uh, it is uh, a huge dent in term, in the claim of affordability uh, mostly, uh, if you see that affordability in the garb of affordability, there are uh, these trends which are very visible. Like, in in fact, online education is a pretext for institutional government to cut the the, the cost, you know, on on infrastructure and the building and the salaries of the teachers. And this trend is not only limited to India. I was in the U.S. at the time of uh, the pandemic, when the pandemic hit, and it was there. The people, they were debating there, and they are still debating the future of the brick and mortar university. Brick and mortar university, like physical university, the way we, we see universities as a building, uh, infrastructure, resources, teachers, etc. And they are saying, they were saying that, uh, there is no future of these kind of university. All the learning will happen in future in online. Even uh, there is a technology penetration is way, way high in uh, in US or in the Western developed countries. And uh, technological computation devices, they are all the learning management system they are using. But still, um, they were skeptic. Certain people were there, those who were skeptic of, uh, of this uh, thing that we should we should switch entirely uh, or we are switching entirely on the online education, you know. So it's uh, 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 in the name of online education, you will see that the future cut uh, in the funding on the salaries, infrastructure, and building, etc. Uh, it is being projected. Uh, there are several studies which project that if you run an online course smoothly, you need one third of the total teaching staff. That would be sufficient, and like. If earlier there was a requirement of three people to run a course, now only one people can do that because mostly uh, lectures are recorded and it is available online. Student can listen those lectures and the examination can be conducted and only the occasional modification uh, is required when the syllabus is revised. So, so that's that it would be really, really cost effective and um, uh, we, we won't require that much a huge workforce. So just lay off the, the extra teachers or extra human resource. Uh, MHRD's latest circular, if, like I assume that you have seen that and they say that, and now they are uh, raising this, uh, like they are asking all the universities uh, to, to offer 20% of their course material through MOOC portal SWAM. Like if you have, uh, is 100 credit course, at least 20 credit course students should do uh, through MOOC portal SWAM and the recorded digital record, digitally recorded lectures are there. Student can learn, student can appear for the exam and they can get certificate. Only 80% you teach as a, within the institution. Now they have raised this thing up to 40% in certain courses. So uh, these, these narratives, these trends are there, which are very visible. And um, it it is it is being propagated that um, yeah it's it's highly affordable. Let's see it, how much affordable it is. Now, like as I said that the online education is not state funded. In future it won't be. Uh, um, 
in spite of instead of being state funded state is planning to cut uh, the existing um, fund uh, on the pretext of online education since online education is inexpensive so why do you need fund okay so affordability students will pay for their education in terms of fee like students still pay uh, for the enrollment and the examinations so the students are charged uh, for these two purposes uh, students pay for their own device like purchase uh, smartphone tablet mobile they have to update if they want to update their learning they need very updated device and the wear and tear like if there is uh, your device is not working it requires repair or it requires replacement so the cost will be bear, will be borne by the by the student data you need a recurring expenditure it is there you require to purchase data monthly uh, and then there is a limit also how much you can download so unlimited download and there is cost involved and that that cost is kind of every month you have to to buy the data so obviously you have to buy this thing you need a space safe and conducive space to study uh, during uh, online education in during pandemic we have seen that so many students they do they did not have uh, a separate study room or personal room or personal space to 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 study and this is the reality uh, there are very cramped spaces a single room accommodation adjacent on roadside lot of crowd and the noise was there so students were they did not unmute themselves they did, they did not um, on the camera because it, it, it would be really uh, humiliating and disgust, um, a source of disgust for them. Uh, so we should not take it as a granted that we have safe and conducive, all the students have safe and conducive space to study. When students come in the school, uh, school classroom or university classroom they provide a uniform setting you know it's a conducive setting but at home the students have different kinds of setting different kinds of reality so certain students may not have safe and conducive space to study we have to think about uh, students are still paying for bad quality of online education correspondence courses like it's not like that uh, students are not paying like certain uh, Online courses are really of the bad quality and correspondent in the name of correspondence courses, students still they are paying and they are getting um, shortchanged for that. So inequity in accessibility and affordability there. So I have demonstrated that yes, uh, online education is inequitable in terms of its accessibility and affordability how to how to address this problem how to how to bridge the gap it requires state and institutional response to mitigate the economic and physical barriers individual teachers uh, we have seen in the pandemic that the teachers and learners they were left alone to navigate during this what was required what is required like it was required it is required even of now it is required um that need assessment like the entire all the section of need assessment of the teachers and the need assessment of the students what kind of assistance or help they require in terms of the handling of technology in terms of training uh, in terms of uh, financial and gadget supports you know so when i was in the umd uh, maryland on Fulbright and this pandemic hit, though there's a high, huge, like very high level of uh, technology penetration, but still when they switched over from the in-person classes to, to online, they send us a form uh, to the kind of training we would require to conduct the classes smoothly. And so many students, so many students and so many teachers opted um, for those training and the trainings were made available uh, free of course they ask like whether they need financial support or not it's kind of thing so we need uh, those kind of support from the state from the institution uh, so then we can uh, make a non-existent system uh, existent or at least bridge the gap 
between those who have the, the gadgets and the device and the training required capabilities and those who don't. Uh, technological support in terms of training, in terms of gadget was required. Uh, and we found that most of the institution lacking. Uh, now, as of now, some, some institutions are doing, but I'm not aware of that, uh, whether they have started this thing at the large scale in rural area schools, in secondary schools, primary schools, et cetera. Uh, digitization of library and serverability. It, it is required, it was required, uh, but um, uh, during pandemic, it was not available. It was not made available uh, for all the students, though certain uh, uh, sections of library like uh, Shod Ganga or the consortium of libraries which were available, journals were available. Uh, but again, for that, you need internet access at home, you need laptop, and you have a very good command over English to, to learn anything meaningful from those uh, library. Uh, all the digitization of books in the regional language or your own faculty or department or school library is or was not digitized. So the student, they did not have access. It is still a very challenging issue that you have to digitize all the learning resources which are available at the institution. So like in my institution, though we have access to the consortium of libraries and that we have access to thousands of journal, uh, worldwide renowned journal free of cost, but we still do not have, uh, digitize uh, fully our, the, the resources, library resources, and mostly the resources which are, uh, they are in the regional language. Uh, as like for in my case, it's a Hindi language. So all the books are not digitized. Those are digitized, those are really valuable resource. I'm not uh, saying that those resources are, but those resources are particularly valuable for higher education, you know. For school education, we need that kind of grade-wise, subject-wise content available in the regional languages. That kind of support was not there. Reality is like neoliberal state is retracting state from key social sector. As in the previous lecture, I have already demonstrated you that uh, we have, we like Indian state have never ever spent uh, promised 6% of its GDP or GNP uh, right from the 1950-51, irrespective of the governments, irrespective of the ideologies of the state. I'm not saying this government is doing that government is not doing and they did and not. I just demonstrated with the hard data provided by the government of India that we have never ever done that. We have never ever spent 6% of our GDP on our education and in near future, I'm not seeing that we are going to do that. So the neoliberalism or neoliberal state uh, is, is the key feature of neoliberal state is that it retracts its responsibility from the social sector like health, education. These are the sectors which uh, were considered as a responsibility of welfare state. But now the shift from the welfare state to the neoliberal state, uh, states are uh, retracting uh, from its responsibility of providing free quality education to all, providing free health to all. And this, uh, this shift is not only in India, uh, we are seeing the shift uh, in, in, in developed worlds also. But uh, the impact of this shift from welfare to neoliberal state uh, is uh, less uh, in, in Western European countries, uh, American countries. Why? Because uh, they have history of like of past 50, 60 years, or past 100 years, they have invested in, in the education uh, so much that now if they are retracting the population, uh, the, the marginal section, they, they, they are feeling the pinch there. But the way we are feeling, we have not uh, addressed the, the structural inequity and the poverty issue and its, its related consequences on the educational attainment. And, um, and the state, uh, we are seeing the neoliberal tendencies in, in the state. We started Sarvish Shiksha and we passed the right to education only in 2009, you know. And uh, we are seeing uh, these um, like state uh, crunch in the state funding in education sector. So it has altogether uh, entire different um, consequence when uh, a developing country or the third world countries uh, are, uh, they are following the path of neoliberalism 
uh, when uh, first world countries, they, they are also following the path of neoliberalism, but the consequences are entirely different. Or uh, if it is not entirely different, I would rather say it is, um, you can feel more pinch because uh, in the first place, we never ever address the problem. So we have more, uh, more to do that. And if we follow the example of those countries, G20, as I said that in the previous lecture, that they have invested in the school education, uh, state-funded public schooling system in, uh, the, in a huge amount, you know, and uh, we have never ever uh, invested and now we are retracting whatever we were investing. So it is very um, convenient to neoliberal educational policies like continuously, they are decreasing spending on education, including higher education. And we are seeing this trend uh, in India, in other countries also. Uh, so digitization of education is a less expensive option available to neoliberal state. And that's why neoliberal state worldwide, they are welcoming that. Yes, digit, yes, do the online education, do the online thing. And because they are seeing the, the potential benefit of doing that, and they are Everybody is in the bandwagon. Uh, if the online system of education exists, they are talking about it. If it doesn't exist, they are talking about it. So mostly they are saying that we are in the same boat. You know, yeah, it's like uh, in pandemic, it was touted by, oh, we are in the same boat. Now everybody's equal kind of thing. We are not in the same boat. We are in the same storm, you know. The storm of the pandemic was there. Somebody was sailing in the yacht. Somebody was sailing in a very good um, big uh, uh, ships. Somebody has like moderate, um, uh, you know, boats, and somebody, uh, some some sections of population, they did not have anything, and they were left alone to sink. You know, so it would be rather appropriate act to say that we were in this, we are in the same storm, or we were in the same storm, but we are on the different boats. Somebody had really good access of internet computing device. And they said that, yes, we wanted online education. We want online education. So you, you have witnessed it also. When we started reopening the elite upper middle class, they resisted opening and they said that we, we do not want uh, school to be open. But when we asked, when there are surveys, there were um, uh, in public domain results are there. They say that when they asked the lower middle class, um, and the deprived section. They say that we want school to be open because school is, is a place, uh, that's the only place which is available uh, for our kids for any kind of education or whatever point quality of education they are getting. That's the only place. And the schools are providing a safe space for certain hours of the day. And it provides midday meal and it provides uh, a limited amount of learning. Otherwise, in the absence of schools, our kids do not have anything. So they, they welcomed opening. They wanted the school to be reopened. So it's like that though, the state, it's an online thing as, and the inexpensive and the less uh, state funding, it has a kind of causal connection. And that's why you would find that the state responses are so much favorable for adoption of um, online education, but not doing anything. I'm not against the online education or for the online. Education. I'm saying that if you are not providing the infrastructure, if you are not addressing those critical issues that at the ground and you are only talking about the online education or uh, digitization of education, then this is a problematic. So without addressing those things, the, the talking is the neoliberalization. Digitization necessarily needs big tech companies, corporations, and they are already in the market. You have seen that uh, in India by Jews and the, all the controversies and the layoff and the claims and the fraud, the, the cheating of the parents, etc. you have seen that. MIT, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, they have uh, the collaboration with the Google, Stanford with Apple, kind of thing. So the big corporations, tech corporation, they will be, they are taking over education space. They will take over. The last thing uh, about the equality, uh, that online education promotes equality or equal quality of education to all. Let's admit that we have, as of now, we have three tier of higher education system. First, we have premium elite in campus education, like you have Yale, Harvard, Delhi University, St. Stephen College, uh, LSR, you know, so 
Central universities, Mizoram University, Arunachal, BH. So these are the well funded, uh, good, some old, some new in campus education and the elite classes, they have access. And non elite classes also have access through affirmative pro action program, but their enrollment is not very phenomenal in terms of the population, student population of India, very less percentage of students are enrolled in the central universities, IIT, IIMs. Majority of students in higher education, if you're talking about higher education, majority of students are enrolled in substandard or uh, resource crunched, or, uh, struggling state universities or some private uh, universities or private colleges um, serving the small town educational need or village, uh, the seal level, uh, the colleges which are located in the rural area and the far flung area. So those institutions are resource trapped. They, they are struggling for the enrollment, for the quality, for the salary and all kind of uh, issues are falling there. Some of the state universities are also struggling in terms of the funding and they are finding it gradually difficult to generate their own resources as mandated by the University Grants Commission. So, and the third we are having, so the students, the students are enrolled in the premium elite in campus uh, system, state university, central universities particularly, uh, and IITs, IIMs, et cetera. There are the students, majority of students enrolled in the state universities and some of the private colleges uh, and the affiliated colleges of the state universities. And the third, uh, the enrollment you will find in the distance and correspondence courses uh, with bit of technology, but not very high degree, high high level of technology. Uh, they are basically, they are offering to poor and largely marginalized section of the Indian uh, students. So these three types, uh, they are running concurrently, you know, they are running concurrently. Uh, if we keep this multi-layered structure of higher education intact for different social classes, like, we are not addressing uh, these uh, structural, like these three types of who goes in, who are enrolled in where, and what is the educational need of different section of population, where, what are the demographic profile of the student, those who are enrolled in these institutions. It would be a rather um, good uh, academic uh, exercise. It should be, it should be done that who is attending what kind of uh, educational institution. So. If we are uh, keeping this thing, so all talk about equality is rhetorical, you know, and it's not going to bring any substantial equality. Uh, basically, we are talking and talking about equality. And since it is really hard to achieve, to provide good quality higher education or comparable good quality of higher education to all section of population, so then, then we shift our attention and focus on the online education. So anyone can attend the online education and they can uh, uh, have uh, like very good quality of education provided by the smaller number of institution. So this present disruption, it like it was uh, this disruption which was we witnessed through uh, in, during pandemic uh, to brick and mortar university. It's very feeble, and it. The online education, it seems that is the another opportunity for the reproduction of the structural educational disadvantages. Like if you are disadvantaged, you have access only to the, the correspondence courses offered by some state universities or state or regional college, or if you have access to the college and state university. So if you are really from the privileged background, you are attending very good quality education and the access to the those premium institution requires a lot of coaching and coaching requires a lot of funding. So your social class decide uh, initially largely that in which kind of uh, education you are. This cycle can be breaked and it is breaked in and wherever you will see the breaks, uh, you will see either the affirmative action program or uh, the state funding or the state support, financial support in terms of scholarship, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that is there. If it is not there, we will find the clear cut class divide uh, in terms of the social demography of the students, those who are attending the questions. 
we have already witnessed that the vocational education and correspondence distance courses in the past. Like uh, correspondence courses and distance courses were um, largely promoted uh, in 86 policy and uh, vocational courses was uh, promoted in, uh, in 52-53 in a Madalia Commission report. And what, what happened? What, if anything history teaches us, we'll see, we, we have seen that the vocational courses, um, which was uh, recommended by Madalia Commission and a lot of JTIs, ITIs were open, uh, junior technical schools and technical schools, Institute of Technical, uh, mostly, uh, None of the upper middle class or affluent section, uh, most they don't attend that. Mostly the the student from marginal section they they enroll there. So vocational courses we we opened vocational courses, but uh, there it was like we stuck there because there was no opportunity of um, like vertical mobility from uh, any GTI or ITI graduate to attend. Uh, to attend engineering program, a BTEC degree program. There was no weightage kind of thing. For engineering and BTEC program, you need um, a very rigorous, another entrance. And uh, that, that entrance requires a lot of coaching and the coaching requires funding. So your, your JTI and your ITIs uh, did not have any kind of structural linkages with your BTEC program. So these two programs, uh, cater to dif two different segments of the population. You know what I'm saying that we have created two kinds of schools, technical schools, for two different section um, social class of the of the our institution. So if we are doing again with this thing, and we are not learning anything from over the past uh, failure or the past uh, policies which have very um, less desired results, uh, then it, it's really, it's it's very really ironical that we are repeating the same, same without learning anything. Uh, like concluding remarks, uh, these are the the myths like afford accessible, affordable, and equal. They are providing good quality education, equal. Uh, beyond that, the in-person classroom, uh, the social potential of in-person classroom in development of the critical consciousness and non-hegemonic perspective among students are uh, immense. Uh, like uh, the, the, the classrooms are the places, universities and colleges and schools are the places not only to learn history, mathematics and physics, you know, it is also a place where you learn a lot of, uh, there's a lot of exposure, you learn a lot of, uh, a thing like which you never ever uh, can witness while enrolling in online and learning in isolation and correspondence course. And to name a few, like the critical consciousness, uh, the critical thinking ability and critical awareness is possible only through the, the in-person teaching and the mentoring of the, the instructor or the teacher or professor, whatever you want to call them. Uh, it's, a, it's a sympathetic guidance and the constant presence is there. And the non-hegemonic uh, perspective and learning is possible only in in in-person setting because in online uh, education, most of the time, uh, due to the limited interaction facility between the instructor and the the participants, uh, is is a kind of uh, it's a barrier. It's a hindering obstacle factor. Uh, as we were discussing prior to this uh, lecture. Uh, Professor Bhartendu, uh, he he told me or he said that uh, earlier they used to open this two-way communication. Any student can open, unmute, and on the camera and can ask. But uh, due to a lot of lot of problems, uh, including lack of training, lack of uh, uh, integrity, and lack of time, and etc., so many factors were there. So they they just disabled that thing, and now you can interact with me only uh, through chat box. And it's ironical. I'm teaching my own uh, my own computer screen, and I cannot see you. At least uh, in Zoom session, when I can see your faces, uh, uh, in 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 terms of the tiles, it creates a different kind of uh, impression. So it is not possible. And the practice of critical pedagogy is being underestimated by the governments, authorities, and enthusiasts of online education. Practice of critical pedagogy is not possible in entirely online education, you know. 
you can use online platform as a support and augment your narratives, your arguments, your discussion. You can use it as a discussion platform, but as, a, as an assistive platform, not as a replacement of the teacher. So you must have remember uh, in your entire education system, one or two teacher, which, uh, whom, uh, whom, uh, you, whom you admire a lot for uh, his or her um, potential ability to motivate you, to mentally stimulate you, and to ask the uh, unusual question, at least uh, he, he or she has supported you. But with that, that, that potential is very limited in all. I'm saying it's, I'm not saying it's entirely impossible, but that potential is very, very limited when online. Like it blended mode can be done when I know my participants uh, and I meet three days in person and two days online. It can be done, but entirely I have never ever seen any one of you. And I like in today's session, I don't know any one of you. Even your name is not um, visible to me. So in that situation, it's really difficult to ensure uh, learning and it is impossible to initiate any critical dialogue uh, among this uh, learning fraternity. So it is also a potential which has been neglected uh, in this uh, entire online debate, uh, particularly, I feel uh, this uh, this absence in in higher education thing. Uh, practice of critical Pajavari and threats of digital surveillance. Obviously, uh, if the threats are there, like you are being recorded, it is uh, like in the beginning of session, it it says that you are being recorded. So you you self-censor, you know, uh, because uh, some of the questions you are asking may be unsettling or maybe very not comforting. So it is like that. You, you cannot practice critical pedagogy uh, entirely on, online. Uh, I would say rather... between technophil and the Luddite, you know? Luddite are the person, those who are, uh, those who fear the, the technology. And uh, it, it was, this term was coined uh, when the industrial revolution started replacing manual labor and the Luddites, they, they just burned the, the machineries and et cetera. So they are called, the people and the group people, those who have irrational fear of the technology, they are called Luddite. And the technophil, obviously, those who love technology. So it's not a kind of a card of choice that either you are luddite or technophil. If you are asking this question, like if you are, if I'm asking this this question, that we should ensure, like online education, yes, we can go, we can go uh, as a gradual shift, but we must ensure accessibility, affordability. We must ask those questions. Uh, prior to implementing uh, about all gaga of uh, this, uh, this, this uh, online education. So you, I, I am really for online education. You can be a technophil, like you, you want technology to be implemented, but I do not want, uh, like I don't, cons I don't perceive technology as a, as a panacea for all the problems. Technology can help, but um, prior to that help, you have to fix your, your 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 ground level reality, then only technology can help. So it is 